Thanks, Jane. Um, as Jane said, I'm Deborah Adi. I'm a costume designer and professor at Montclair State University in the Design Tech Management um, BFA. And again, welcome to our second panel. I am thrilled to uh, introduce our panelists today. Um, they're all going to talk a little bit about their career options, define their jobs, and show you some of their work. Please um, put your questions, if you have questions, into the chat bar. We have um, Elizabeth Popiel, who will be moderating a Q&A following all the presentations. Do your very best not to do large group chats. Keep it open if you can for the questions coming off of the panelists' um, work. We will be posting some of the websites that uh, you can look at for our guests and um, who are Greg Barnes, costume designer, Neka Bennett, graphic design, er, Neil Patel, scenic and production design, Lacey Erb, projection and lighting design. Marie Wagner, who's an art director and assistant art director. And Jane Shaw, who is a sound designer. And I am going to begin with Greg Barnes. And I think I am going to, let's see, I have to share my screen. So give me just a moment to get all of that uh, hello, everybody. It's uh, nice to be with you today. I um, uh, I thought I would take a second, if it's okay, to talk about where I came from in relationship to what I do. Uh, I grew up in San Diego, and I was uh, not a theater kid, unfortunately. I mean, I loved the theater, but my family were very Little League focused. We were that kind of family. So other than going to Oh, the, if an ice show came to the sports arena, we would we, we could go see that because it was in a sports arena. I think that was the sort of compelling uh, uh, connective tissue or the circus, things like that. But I didn't really start to develop a love of the theater until I was really in college. Um, I was going to teach English, so I was a literature major and I s wandered into the costume shop because uh, well, I think it drew me in, in, in a sense. And um, I took a course because I thought I would be the, the, the English teacher who is also the drama guy at the high school. That was my sort of uh, goal. And I thought, well, I, I get, maybe I need to know something about lighting and scenery and clothes before I uh, think I would be qualified to do this task. And um, I took a course uh, in, it was really a theater history class that incorporated a little bit of design. And so this was my final year at San Diego State as a B, getting my BFA in literature. And I took this class and um, the teacher a week before we graduated said, hey, uh, there's a professional designer coming to the school to, uh, interview our MFA students, and I think you should go talk to him. Um, and the reason I think it's that I'm even bringing this up is that it was one of the first times in my life that somebody basically pay, uh, reached out their hand and said, I see something in you, I believe in you. And I went and talked to Robert Morgan, who some of you may know, generous, amazing Robert Morgan. and. He said, go to New York. And I was so flummoxed because I didn't even know, I didn't draw or paint or sew or other than what I, and when I would go into the Cosmos shop at SDSU, they'd have me do things like burn the, the, the thread out of the wheels on the mannequins because I was so useless. I could do nothing. So I thought, well, that's not a great, you know, base, you know, uh, foundation to, uh, run off to New York City. And I remember I went home that day and I said to my dad, hey, this designer, uh, you know, mentioned that he thought this might be something I, I could do. And he looked at me and he said, you got to get a job, baby. Uh, but 
being a good dad, a good little league kind of dad, he uh, uh, helped me on my way. And I, I spent a year and a half while I was still getting my teaching credential, designing everything I could in every community theater basement to uh, prepare myself to come to NYU. And I found that I did have a facility for a lot of the skills that you need. Um, I was already somebody who loves storytelling. Every designer is gonna tell you that. It's the, it's the most crucial part of it. But I could sort of draw and I could sort of paint and I could sort of sew and I could sort of do all the things. I had a, um, so when I got to NYU, where there were a lot of people that had been art majors and they had a much more uh, sturdy uh, experience coming into that. Um, I thought, what did I think? I thought, I'm gonna do okay. I, I, I don't know much, but I think that I'm a good learner. Um, and actually that impulse of being a good learner is a crucial thing in the theater because I think what keeps motivating us to do it is that we're always learning. You never, you know, you have this big sack of, of experience and knowledge that you create around with you, but there's always something that is leading you to a new solution, a new idea, a new way of looking at the world, a new uh, reframing uh, how you see the world. So I got out of NYU. I just celebrated my 40th anniversary of moving to New York uh, this, this past September. So I've been here 40 years. I had a five-year plan to get be a big Broadway sensation after I got out of school in 1983. Well, five years came, I, was, I couldn't even afford to see a Broadway show, much less be a sensation. Then 10 years and then 15 years. And then in the 16th year by a series of miraculous gifts, I got my first Broadway show. And then I thought, well, now I'll be a sensation. Well, no, it took six more years to get my second one. So 21 years into my five-year plan, I finally uh, started to get to work in that arena. Not to say that that is everybody's dream and everybody's bucket list, but for some reason it had meaning for me. Um, and all the time I was doing that, I was, I, ironically, I did end up teaching at NYU in their undergrad department. Uh, so um, what does a costume designer do? They, uh, the thing that I love about the job is that it's very bipolar. <laughs> that doesn't seem to go together necessarily, but there's a long stretch of time where you really are just, just you and a desk, a, a drawing table and a white piece of paper. And you're imagining through the collaboration of the director and the choreographer, if it's a musical and the playwright and the, er, the other designers, a world. And you have to flesh that out. And if you're doing a thing like Aladdin that has 300 costumes in it, or maybe 323, I think it is. And there are 323 sketches and you're ridiculous about how you approach that. And they take four, five, six, seven, I'm, I'm ashamed to say hours. Time sat by 323 and you understand that the alone time is very, very, uh, it's, a, it's a long stretch of time. And then you go to bid and you are thrown into the world and you are running like a cat with its tail on fire, apologies to cats, and trying to get this show to happen, inspire people to make it, inspire people to pay for it, inspire people to wear it. Um, so I know every designer would tell you there are different things about the process uh, that really, really feed their soul. It might be the research, it might be the actor, it might be the, the, the textiles, it might be uh, just being part of a collective of, of incredible collaborators. And you need all of those things in some degree, but I think it's important to, to really get to the heart of what about this feeds you so that you continue to love doing it because it's not, as we've all will talk about, it's not the easiest path. They do pay you, but uh, sometimes they don't pay you. Sometimes, you know, you work on a job that you, for years and it never bears fruit. And in any other circumstance, you, you know, you wouldn't do that for $500 
uh, on, a, on a pledge that this might bear fruit. Um, but then there are things where, bam, you're part of a hit. I've only been part of a couple of hits, so, but, um, and then financially you get to sort of be, uh, reap the, the awards of that. So rewards of that. So anyway, I love all the parts of it. I'm very bad at the computer. That part of it I'm dreadful at, which is why Deborah's sharing her screen and not, I'm not sharing mine. Um, but I hire young people to help me with that. Uh, and I try to be constantly uh, trying to enlarge the world as I see it. I mean, I think that's the beauty of having a career in the theater. So. Um, I don't know with, uh, how my time is doing, but, but in terms of being a designer, those are some of the things, I know that's very eclectic and random and, and meandering way of uh, describing what we do, but it, 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 it encompasses everything. It's intellectual, it's spiritual, it's graphic, it's financial, it's uh, about people skills, it's about, it really tests you on every single part you don't you know you're not isolated where your one brilliant skill is used by by people to um to realize a vision and i i i uh, that's one of the things that i love about it that and meeting the inspired inspirational people that we get to travel along with the other designers the makers uh i can't stress that enough the people that make the clothes so how am i doing deborah Great. Um, I'm going to remove the spotlight and show some of your amazing work. Maybe you'd like to talk over it. Okay. And share my screen. Resume share. All right. Can everybody see this? I can. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, these are some sketches from Follies, which I did, um, I think it was in 2011. Uh, we did it at the Kennedy Center. Uh, it was really funded because Bernadette Peters was interested in doing a production of Follies. Just by fate, it did come into New York. But it was, a, it was um, this often happens it was an experience that I worked on for many, many years because it was grossly underfinanced, but I wanted to do it so passionately. And so I uh, uh, carted those sketches around for years, trying to inspire anybody I knew that had a skill I could uh, you know, bring into the, the family to um, make this thing happen. So, um, so this was Follies. I ended up this dress here, the dress itself was a dress from my, my, my five-year plan uh, from Sideshow that, that and I put a $12,000 dress in a washing machine, dye, dyed it, we made the train and the headpiece, but the, the, the whole thing came from other things. And I had actually done Follies at the Paper Mill Playhouse where I used to be the resident designer. So I had some things that I could uh, repurpose for this particular production. I had people making stuff in Las Vegas, in San Diego, in Milwaukee, Denver. We were, uh, we were truly, when they say it takes a village, it really took a country and then a few other countries to make this happen. It's an amazing experience. And I was younger, nine years younger. I don't know if I could do it again. These are some uh, sketches from Kinky Boots, uh, which uh, uh, was, I can't remember the year, it was, a, it was after Follies. And, um, you know, it, it, this, you know, every show you look back on it and you sort of fall in love, it, they all become your favorite child. And then, there, then there's a new child that you fall dearly in love with. But, uh, Kinky Boots was, it's one of those shows that had a very fraught out of town where we changed so much, so much custom clothing got, never saw the stage. But it was done in a, in a circle of supportive, 
collective, we made some mistakes as we were developing this and, and every decision that we made was for the better. So I know it was hard on the actors because you know they get used to being in the fitting room and seeing you're developing these things on them and then all of a sudden they're not wearing it, especially the ensemble people, but um, it was a gift. I mean, I, I loved the story. I loved the, the, I got to go, you know, we did it in Korea, Japan, uh, Australia, Germany, England, Canada, the US tour, uh, basically everywhere. We got to go everywhere with Kinky Boots. And I never gave more interviews on a show than I did on Kinky Boots because people are, I think are obsessed with shoes. I couldn't figure it out. I thought, why is, you know, every single time they'd go to a new city, which later in the tour, you know, it's every week, I'd have to talk to the, you know, the local paper about the, the footwear. So that was, uh, I honed my interview skills a little bit. These are some sketches from Aladdin. You know, Aladdin was the opposite of Follies. It was uh, res the resource, the red carpet of resources was laid out. Um, I won't tell you the budget or unless you want to ask me later, but it was a significant amount of money uh, was spent on these costumes. We're actually redoing it right now for uh, uh, a, a new tour because the, the carpet itself takes so long to load in and takes up so much space and is so the weight of it, it can only go into certain theaters. So we've had to revise the, the design um, to be more practical, to be able to get to more people. So I've been, that's what I've been doing on my COVID horrible vac vacation is re-examining Aladdin to make it uh, a little bit more practical. <laughs> Thank you so much, Greg. Yeah. I will unspotlight you, I believe. Yeah. I'm going to have to figure that out. <laughs> I did it last time. <laughs> um, I'll mute myself. OK. So our next guest is Neka Bennett. And Neck, I'm going to see if I spotlight you, if um, you overshadow. Oh, I know what I can do, what I did. Yeah. And Neck, there you are. Hi. Hi. How are you? Um, I haven't tried to share my screen, so maybe I'll do that. Cool. So I'm a graphic designer. Um, I work in New York, but I, I did work in LA for a little while. I'm showing you this picture because this is the first picture that I drew when I was like in ninth grade, my first serious picture. I used to spend a lot of time in the library looking at books and I was really curious about other cultures and other people. And I would just sit and draw these elaborate photographs um, and just really get into the enjoyment of the details and everything. It was just something that I really enjoyed to do. Um, when I graduated from high school, I decided to go to art school, which was kind of a risky choice for the guidance counselor and my mother. But um, it actually worked out. My art teacher was very encouraging um, and it turned out pretty well. I ended up going to Rhode Island School of Design. Um, I studied illustration and animation, um, but the whole time I was there, I wasn't really thinking about getting a job. I was just enjoying what I was doing the whole time. Um, so, you know, senior year, I kind of scrambled and tried to figure it out. So when I graduated, I, um, I did a bunch of things, like I did some animation, I did backgrounds for animation, um, illustrated children's books for a while, and then I got into graphic design and I was doing websites uh, when that became popular. And then uh, finally, I landed at a book publisher and was designing book covers. So let's see, I have some of those. These are some of my book covers. Um, 
I did that for five years and it was great. It was stressful because I was kind of learning as I went along, um, but it was really enriching because I was helping somebody take their writing and like uh, bring it to life, you know, with the cover. Um, so then after that, I needed a break and I decided to go to LA for a while and was asking people, you know, like what kind of jobs were related to graphics or visual effects. I didn't really know what direction I wanted to head into. And finally, um, I found someone who was an art director um, on a TV show. And I didn't know what that meant because an art director in publishing is very different from an art director on TV shows and films. Um, so we talked about it and she said, next time, you know, I get on a project, I'll hire you as my PA. And I was like, cool. So I PA'd with her um, at Fox on a little Rob Lowe TV show. <laughs> Um, and it was great. I learned a lot. We were right on stage, on the Fox stages, and um, I learned a lot. But my graphic design work, previous graphic design work, kind of informed how I moved forward. So ultimately, I got into the union. Um, this is like some of the branding stuff I did. Um, so finally, I got, I did that one show at Fox, and then I got a little uh, MTV show at, as the lead graphic. It was a learning experience again. <laughs> so we did these, um, we had a poster, we had to make a record store. So I made all these posters. Um, we were very limited in what we could use font wise, but uh, we had a stock resource that we could use. So it was just like, I could make whatever I wanted. And so this is the record store that we had to make, we had to cover everything. It was empty. It was actually an old gymnastics school. <laughs> so the production designer wanted to plaster the walls with um, records and posters. So the image on the left is the storefront and the image on the right is the set, like the on set that they built. Um, and so we just had to like work like crazy making all these posters and albums, um, just printing them in-house. Uh, it was great. It was really awesome. I had a great time. And then I decided to move back to New York because that's where I'm I'm from the East Coast. And I didn't really want to put down roots in LA. So I came back. This is actually some um, neon signs that we did for the record store also. And the girls' room, the one on the right is in the girls' room on set. Uh, that was also pretty cool because I just I learned how to do neon signs. I learned that you could take your drawing and they would just make it into a neon sign, which was amazing. So then um, back in New York, I worked on a film called Shirley, and it was set in 1940s, in the 1940s, um, about a girl that disappeared. Um, well, actually, it was about a couple that you know moved to Connecticut. Um, to teach at a college and there was a rumor around um, that this girl had disappeared and so we had to make all these graphics about like I had to make a newspaper um, showing the event that happened that inspired Shirley Jackson the writer who was writing a story about this this girl um, and it was a really great project I used some stock imagery we had to make pill bottles because the lead character took a lot of uh, medication um, this all took a lot of research, you know, looking at what existed in the past um, and trying to make it real. This was from um, another show called I Know This Much Is True, and part of it was set in the past where a girl, this guy's trying to get married and he needed, a, he wanted to marry this girl who was in Italy, and this is the photograph of her. So we had to age it and make it look like a daguerreotype. Um, this was from a show, Blind Spot, where we had to create like a surveillance image. So it was a composite of this band that they shot and then stock imagery of the background. So I had to choose a, a photo of the van that could be paired with this image of the background um, where the lighting was complementary, and then age it or not just age it, but add effects to make it look like a surveillance video. 
So also the things that I do is make IDs, I make vinyls for cars. Um, all this is like a <laughs> trial by fire. Like some, like this is my first police car I ever did. And that was a learning experience. Like um, you have to get the dimensions and you have to make sure that they match. Um, and it was a little wonky. Uh, the bottom is ID cards. Um, for a person in Croatia. So we had to do research about what, you know, the emblem of Croatia is. That was interesting. These are some random liquor bottles that I made. Um, the center one is like a Russian bottle. Um, the one on the left is a bottle from the, mm, 1912 or so, an anisette bottle. Um, some of these are recreated and the, the two on the right are um, actually just created from stock and like just my own graphics. This one was a project um, where I had to create like a fake Facebook. So um, they wanted it turned up to 10 or a million basically. So the, in, the, the television in the center is like the video player and everything in the background was animated. So I got a chance to play with my After Effects skills to um, make that all work and some programming too. So we had to make sure that, you know, we could make it work when the actor clicked on something, it would animate. Um, so that was a very intensive project. This one, I'm sorry if I'm just rambling. <laughs> um, this one is, uh, this is like the second to last picture, but this was um, something that I had to mock up to show like this, small town where we had um, a sign that was aged and it was old and um, small quaint old rundown town. And um, so we had to create the effects. I had to you know, lay this out for the scenics and for the construction to let them know what the treatment would be. And so that was very fun. And then the left photograph is like a mock-up of that in location. Um, so they would know exactly how to set it up and what it would look like. And this is the last one. This is um, from a film called The Half of It. Uh, and there's two girls in the film who make this collaborative mural. They're communicating with each other, but one is kind of masquerading as a guy. But so one girl thinks she's talking to this guy who's very sensitive. <laughs> um, and in fact, he's catfishing her. <laughs> but the mural they create is very beautiful and uh, they have this lovely experience of exchange. Um, it's exciting to them and it's hopeful. So I got a chance to mock this up and then the Phoenix executed it on the, on the wall um, location. So that's it, that's everything. I can't hear anyone say anything. Uh, hi, Mecca. <laughs> it hi. feels a little lonely out there, all spotlighted. <laughs> I'm like, I think I'm talking to myself. I don't know. No, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Uh, let's see if I can get back to um, Neil Patel is our next guest, and I'm going to see if I can uh, locate him and, and get to his screen here. So I should share my screen now. Yeah. Are we good? I think we are. It's all yours, Neil. All right, then I'll start. Um, I'm actually. All right, thank you, Deborah. I'm starting with um, the thing I'm doing, the, my la latest thing, and I'll kind of work my way back, show you how I got to what I'm doing now. Um, so I'm a production designer. I'm also a scenic designer. I um, currently am designing um, Dickinson for Apple TV. Um, and I'm gonna show you some photos of season two, which is about to come out on January 8th. And I'm in prep for season three. And, um, you know, like a lot of people who end up doing um, production design, especially in New York, I, my roots are really in, in the theater. 
which is what I trained um, to do. And before that, I um, also, like Greg would say, I didn't really know that much about theater in high school and in uh, growing up, but I was really interested in fine arts and in architecture. And, um, you know, it's one of those people who spent a lot of time in the art room in high school, which was a great, uh, a great place for me to be. And um, I went to school to become an architect. And when I was there, I went to a liberal, I went to Yale, I went to a liberal arts college. So I, I was, it was a liberal arts degree and there were a lot of people making theater there and someone asked me to make a set and I really didn't know that that was a profession so but I knew how to make things so I um I did that and I really um I kind of fell in love with that process and that work then which kind of led me astray from becoming an architect as a profession and led me to um pursuing theatrical set design um which eventually morphed into um, yeah, I did work and uh, I went I I eventually went to um, University of California San Diego it, and I was in an MFA program there and really started my career at La Jolla Playhouse which was professional theater associated with that school and um, worked my way back to New York worked off Broadway, eventually was able to work on Broadway, opera, and then through, actually through writers and producers I knew, got involved in film and television, um, which hey, is Neil, mostly where I am now, but um, Neil, I go back and forth. Yeah? Muskie, your screen is frozen, yep. so I think we have to restart your screen share somehow. Oh, okay. Uh, how do I do it? Do I stop the share? All right, do I share again? Maybe yeah. you have to relaunch it or something. All right, let me try it again. Is that working? Yeah, we're seeing your beautiful drawings and, and photos. Great, all right, good. Great. So everyone can see it. So you're looking at what you're looking at now in uh, the first slide you're seeing, this is, um, this is a, so, in this show, it's a period show. It's about Emily Dickinson. It takes place in the mid 19th century. So we have to build a lot of sets because we can't find locations like this um, to shoot in. And this is the parlor we built for season two of Evergreens, which is based on a real building. It was built by um, the Dickinson family for Emily Dickinson's brother, Austin and his wife, Sue. So this was an Italianate Victorian villa and kind of take you through this, what you're seeing is the parlor this is the hall this is the s s library and the bedroom so these sets take a long time to research design and build and they're made with a you know in, in on a on a television series or on a film we have a whole art department so i work with art directors and set decorators and scenic artists and um, and prop department to put this together and to really um, really tell tell a story that has to go through um, ten episodes of this of this show. But the main point of this house was to really contrast the house we in the first season, the original Dickinson home, which has a more austere federal style and kind of what we think of as a New England home. This was built to be a kind of show place and very elaborate and very somewhat decadent. They were kind of spending more money than they had. And these um, characters are holding European style salons. And, um, and it was just really that, that the kind of emotional and um, narrative of the second season really revolves around this idea. This is the, exterior of the house. So we built, the interior sets were built at um, Kaufman Astoria Studios and the exterior at Beth Page, Beth Page Historical Village out in Long Island, which we kind of occupy for a few months when we're shooting the show. This house actually, the bottom floor, I've used my cursor, everything below where I'm passing my arrow was built, we could say practical, it was real dimensional and dressed everything above it is visual effects so 
uh, I had to work on this show because we did a lot of visual effects. I had to work very closely with the visual effects supervisor to figure out, to make sure that what my sets would match and, and, and work seamlessly with what they would do in post. So in the end, we get this image, this kind of this cool image of this, of this Victorian villa. And hopefully the audience has no idea that half of it's fake. Because I have a, a background in opera and theater, this um, season was really fun because we got to go, The uh, all the characters go see La Traviata in Boston in 1859, I think, which La Traviata would have been a, a new opera then and kind of a scandalous opera. And Emily kind of conflates Violetta, the character in the opera, with her sister-in-law, Sue. So the two-dimensional scenery in the back is sort of a, a, a throwback to the Evergreens parlor. So the, all these ideas we had to sort out in prep in the beginning, because I had all the scripts um, to work with, so I could kind of make all those connections. This is a printing press we created. Um, this is a 19th century um, steam driven printing press. This is also a combination of um, practical scenery and visual effects. We actually only built a couple of these printing presses and then you, you um, tile in the rest. It's a very um, long and tedious process, but the end result is uh, kind of a seamless um, extension of, of, the, of the scenery. And that was a fun one to do. So that, then I'm going to talk about uh, my next project. I'm going to talk about it. it's a feature film called Dil de This is a, um, a Hindi film, Bollywood film I made five years ago, um, starring Priyanka Chopra and Ranveer Singh, Anil Kapoor, a lot of um, great actors, Hindi cinema actors. I um, this movie was made primarily on a ship in the Mediterranean. We had to redress the entire ship. Um, well, not all of it, but a lot of a lot of the external pieces. But this was um, a classic thing in production design and film. We had to shoot a lot of location work on this boat and then the land scenes, which were in Turkey and one was in Italy. And then all the scenes that take place in the cabins of the boat had to be built as sets because it's very difficult, almost impossible to shoot these rooms on a boat. They're too small. There are a lot of restrictions. So um, the first part of the shoot was on these locations. This was a Haman in Istanbul. These are all real places. This is an office in Bombay. The, and then we built these sets. This is a hallway we built in a, on stage that is supposed to be on the ship. This is the infirmary and the ship. These are all sets. So the good thing about the way we did this movie is because we did the location first, I had a lot of information to know how to make the sets connect to you know, this, like one of the, the bigger um, cabins, the parents, their kids, they're having an argument. And then we had to have um, Bollywood mo movies combine uh, vocabulary of musical theater. So people sing and dance in the middle of the movie. There's usually typically three large scale musical numbers. This one was it's supposed to be in a, a um, styled as a, as a um, art deco club in the ship. We built this on stage. So these take a long time. These are more pictures, more cabin. So that, and that leads me to a theatrical production I did around the same time. I was asked to do a musical version of a movie called um, Mughal Azam, which is a really famous old Bollywood movie. We did this um, on a, 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 the, the National Center of Performing Arts in Mumbai. And this was um, this is a very challenging theatrical design because it's a movie, of course, that has multiple locations. The movie was known for the grandness of its sets because it's recreating Mughal palaces from the 16th century. And what we did in this design is really combine, um, like you see a lot on Broadway now, is combine um, projection design with with real scenery, sort of the same way you design you combine um, visual effects with practical scenery and film except this happens all live in front of the audience. So you don't have the post period to do it. So we use projectors, but um, this is actually one of the big scenes in the, in the movie and musical is the um, Palace of Mirrors. And um, we used actually practical spinning mirrors with projection and lighting 
and a lot of dancers and amazing costumes, actually. This is a play I designed um, called Father Comes Home from the War, parts one, two, and three by Susan Lurie Parks. Um, this premiered in New York about five years ago, and we took it to Los Angeles and to Cambridge, Mass, to ART, and then to London. This is the London production, the World Court. It takes place in a, a slave cabin in West Texas, but it, as you can see in the picture on the left, it has a kind of abstract um, element to it. The house flies up at a certain point. This is a design I did on Broadway um, 2017 called Time of the Conways. It's a revival of a play from the 20s or 30s rather. Um, and you, this is at the American Airlines Theater. What was interesting about this set is the play takes place in two periods in the same room and there's about a 20 year lap. So the first set on the upper left was in 1919, as it says in the projected title there. And then that set eventually tracks backwards and we flew in a replica of that set, but it had aged with transparent walls in front of it. So that at a certain point in the production, you see both rooms stacked one behind the other, and then it flies out and we go back into that room. It was actually technically really a challenge, like the stage mechanics of this were really challenging because we, we didn't want to see any visible supports. We wanted to kind of just float in magically in front of the other set. This is back, I mean, like a lot of designers, I did, you know, a certain period, a lot of regional theater. This was a production of Major Barbara from the Guthrie Theater. The, for the final act is one of my favorite things, this kind of missile factory, the futuristic thing. This is an independent film called Little Boxes. It, actually, you can watch it on Netflix with Nelson Ellis and Melanie Linsky, two wonderful actors about a New York family that moves to the Pacific Northwest, which we had to show in Harrison. That was the big production design challenge was making it look like we weren't in New York, which is something we often have to do. This is an opera, Alcina, that I did in uh, at the Washington National Opera at Kennedy Center and Bogart directed it. Um, abstract. My, my stage designs tend to be, I tend and like abstraction as opposed to my film and television work, of course, we are dealing with real architectural spaces. Um, this is uh, Mr. Burns, a post-electric play that was at, from Playwrights Horizon. Um, this was a really fun, this is a futuristic dystopian society where um, they, the, their culture is the ep an episode of The Simpsons. So at the final act, which is on the left, we're seeing a, um, uh, a kind of an operatic production of the uh, Cape Fear episode of, of The Simpsons. And this is Lynn Nottage's, by the way, Meet Vera Stark. It takes place in um, Hollywood in the 1930s, it's kind of pre-code Hollywood. And then the second half of the, of the production involved a 15-minute film we made and projected, and then it segues into a 1970s talk show where we see the actors from the 30s aged and talking about this period. And this is a production of Ghosts I did in um, Berkeley a few years ago, um, also kind of abstract. And this is a marriage of Figaro I did in Japan. I got to work in Japan quite a bit in this period with the director Amon Miyamoto and we did the, we got to do the entire Mozart de Ponte cycle. Um, and this, this is Marriage of Figaro. And this is a production I did at La Jolla Playhouse a few years ago, Blueprints to Freedom um, by Michael Washington. This is Madame Mao, and a new opera by Bright Shang I did at Santa Fe Opera in 2003. And this is um, In Treatment, which was a, um, HBO show about therapists starring Gabriel Byrne. Um, this is um, season three, actually, to the left, um, and season two to the right. But the, these were, this was my first big stage build for television production. So I guess it's about 10 years ago. The showrunner, Warren Light, um, just the connectivity between different um, mediums. Warren is a playwright, and um, I designed Sidemen for him on Broadway. 
and that's how we began our collaboration. And then when he um, became the showrunner for In Treatment, he asked me to design, to be the production designer. And, and this is the last slide. This is the production that unfortunately, sadly, was um, delayed because of COVID. This is a, um, a, what we call an immersive theater. So immersive theater here that you travel through, like, um, I don't know if any of you have been to see Sleep No More. There's lots of these shows now that are popular, uh, different way to experience live performance. And this was a show conceived by David Byrne, musician, and Malagankor, a uh, technologist, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a journey through different spaces where you kind of learn about, in an entertaining and kind of trippy way, learn about the, the creation of self in the brain. And then we kind of deconstruct that and have all sorts of kind of pretty fun environments to go through. So this was going to start in, um, it was supposed to have opened this year in Denver and then eventually come to London and New York. So hopefully, I'll get back to it um, when we can do things like this. All right, I think that's it. Wow, thanks, Neil. That's such beautiful work um, and such amazing projects. Um, what a treat. Anyway, Lacey Erb uh, is our next panel guest and Lacey um, is a projection and lighting designer. Welcome, Lacey. Hi there. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen real quick. Um, all right, did that come across? Can you guys see that? Yes. Great. Thanks for the check. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I am Lacey Erb. Uh, I I'm a projection and media designer and also an associate designer. And I'll talk a little bit about what the difference is on those things um, in a little bit. But uh, I currently live in Brooklyn, New York and the, my pronouns I use are she and they. So uh, this first image is um, actually a mock-up image of a piece I did for um, a new musical called Monet. And it was, it was all about Monet and his imagery and, and his uh, relationship with his wife, who this is a painting of. So that's what that first image is. Um, I'm gonna go through and kind of just talk about what projections are a little bit, and then I'll talk about how I got into it. Um, so at a basic level, projection design is about putting pictures and video on stage that tell a story. Um, it is the creation of imagery and film and motion graphics uh, that are, <clears throat> excuse me, that are integrated into live performance um, as, as part of, of either a performance or an installation. Um, for a lot of people, it feels like a new area of design, um, but in fact, it's been around for well over a hundred years. Um, in the twenties, you know, directors were using movie projectors to enhance productions. Joseph, uh, Joseph Svoboda was using slide projectors in the 50s. This is some of his work um, to great effect. Um, and really the difference now is that technology has been changing so quickly. Uh, and what we can do is very different from what could be done with just a movie projector or um, a slide projector. Uh, the brightness of projectors, the ability to incorporate LED screens into scenery have changed so much. Um, and in addition to that, you know, um, the ways we create imagery now is have have grown significantly. People are using three D generated imagery. They're using three D, um, you know, computer graphic imagery. Uh, people are using game engines to design imagery for the stage. Uh, it's actually quite exciting. Um, the range of imagery that can be created, in addition to, you know, live camera work. Um, and traditional art forms like drawing and painting um, and photography. And, and as a projection designer, really we get to use them all and it's really, really quite exciting. Um, and projection design sits kind of somewhere uh, in between uh, technology. And, and one of the things um, that is really fun to be able to include is, is live camera work. And in this particular show, it was uh, a piece 
um, based on uh, Solime. And we had a prop that had, that we worked with the lighting department and put LED lights in its eyes and a camera in its mouth. And um, the actor interacted with this prop on stage and um, we were able to live feed back the image. So that's just one example of, you know, inc including live camera on film. Um, there, you know, a lot of other shows are, are doing similar things. Um, West Side Story, for example, uh, recently on Broadway did a lot of, of live camera work, uh, but it's really exciting to be able in to include those things uh, as part of our design on stage. Um, so, like I said, projection design often sits kind of as a blend between storytelling and technology. And um, one of the things that I get excited about is that every project is different. Uh, each show, you have to figure out what the imagery is going to look like, how the show is going to move. Uh, is it going to be imagery that's, you know, very heavily photography based? Is it going to be stylized text? Um, is it going to be illustrated drawings or am I creating 3D imagery or computer generated imagery? And you know, each time it's different and each show takes a different approach. Um, and as a designer, it, I always get to use a variety of skills and I'm constantly learning new things, uh, which is super exciting, uh, as well as working with other amazing designers and directors and storytellers. Uh, that's always so much fun. Um, you know, the design process itself is creating the artwork for a production. Um, but in addition to that, we as designers design how it's going to be delivered or displayed as part of the performance, you know. Uh, and that can meet that basically means designing the system that could include projectors and computers, uh, motion trackers, you know, any of the control equipment, that's all a piece of what projector, projection design includes. So there's a really strong technical aspect. Um, and projection to design is its own department. I mean, it's separate from scenery and it's separate from lighting, but we work very closely with all of those departments. Um, early on, we work closely with the scenery department to create the surfaces for the imagery that will be seen on or incorporate LED screens into the set. And then once we're in the theater, um, we work more closely with lighting and sound as we essentially visually score the show. Um, you know, a lot of people will talk about sound design scoring a, a movie or a scoring a piece of theater and, and projection design is very similar to that in that it's visually scoring a piece. Um, and in that process, whoop, that's not the one I want. Oh dear, stand by. My, this is the picture I want. Oh, my slideshow is not showing me the ones I want. Let me try sharing this in a different way. Sorry, folks. No problem. You're probably the most technologically advanced person in this uh, room. And yet I still stumble. <laughs> so here we are. You're making us all feel so much better. It, it is definitely a skill that takes practice, no matter how you do it. Okay, well, in that case, we're just going to look at my PowerPoint design page. All right, can you see this image of a theater now? Great, yes. thank you. So, um, 
you know, there are lots of people involved in making projection design and it's really a, a team that makes it happen. And in addition to, you know, we're, we're a projection designer, um, you know, there's a video engineer and associates and assistants and, and, and people that are involved in making bigger shows. Um, and, you know, the team of people who is in charge of installing all the projectors, um, you know, it's, it's not just the designer, it, it, it's quite a lot of people involved, uh, programmers who make the show happen. Um, and I mentioned that in addition to being a designer myself, I'm an associate designer. And what that means is that I assist a designer on a production or an installation. Um, and often I do the technical drawings to figure out where projectors go into the space. Uh, I oversee the installation and the focus of the equipment. Uh, sometimes I go to the scene shop and help test things and give feedback on scenic elements um, and generally track technical element, elements throughout the, the process of, of putting on show and, and tech so the designer can pay attention to what the look of the show is. Um, and then in addition to that as an associate, oftentimes I do get to create imagery that becomes part of a show. Um, or for specific portions of the show. Uh, this is one of the shows that I, I worked on uh, a couple of years ago, Head Over Heels. And, you know, we took the scenic of the scenery of this cave that was, you know, all these roots underneath, underneath this, at like you were underground and turned them into snakes. And all of these were animated. And I spent a lot of time working on that. And that was a lot of fun. Um, and the thing about projection design is that people come at it from all sides. Um, some designers come at it from a theater background, some from a film or graphic design background, and there's really no one path to get to being a projection designer. Um, you know, I, I became interested in storytelling. Greg was talking about, you know, being, storytelling being an important piece of, of what these jobs do. Um, I became interested in that in, in elementary school and with the idea of designing with light and not really knowing how to do that. Um, and in high school, I did a little bit of set construction and lighting design. And um, in high school or in college, in undergrad, I actually started by studying uh, electrical and biomedical engineering. So the furthest thing from theater um, and ultimately I, uh, finished undergrad with, uh, BFA in lighting design, uh, and worked for a number of years in Denver doing lighting design and, and technical direction and went back to school for, uh, to study projection design specifically at University of Texas at Austin, um, in their integrated media for live performance program, um, and um, I've been in New York for three years now. And you know, while we've got a pause right now with, with things happening with COVID, you know, I'm still involved in doing a lot of media-based work right now. It just happens to be more um, electronic-based and, and web performance and um, you know, film editing and that kind of thing. But it, it's a lot of skills that carry over, so that's been a lot of fun to actually expand that way while we are in this place where things are changing, but it's good. All right. Thank and you so much, Lacey. Thank you. Let's see. There. And our next panelist is Marie Wagner who is an art director and where are you Marie? Oh hi, I will spotlight you. Hi. Um, so to start out I'll give a like brief uh, introduction as to how I got into the industry. Um, I was a theater kid in high school I had the enormous privilege to go to a large public high school that had a huge theater department, um, which is where I learned about building sets and painting drops and like many things around theater. And so I studied it in college, graduated, moved to New York, 
and had the good fortune to uh, link up with a couple of designers that did variety for film and television. So it was non-union at the time. Um, it was a lot of live and live to tape, um, MTV, Comedy Central, you know, like comedy specials in theaters and, um, you know, MTV wraparounds and things like that. And so that's like how I got into television at the beginning. And I spent some years working in reality TV. I art directed the television show Top Chef for three seasons. Um, uh, I bounced around a lot. So it was a lot of like different things. And then I joined the union in 2008. And from around 2009 or so really started working, like honing my skill as a set designer. And uh, to explain what the job of a set designer is, you, you are there to sort of be the architect that draws the plans that the production designer wants to achieve. So you are there to give input and uh, help realize the set designer, the, um, the production designer's vision. Um, so it's a really sort of like, it, it can be kind of technical nuts and bolts and it's a very different job depending on who you're working with. So I'll share my screen right now. I've, I've chosen not to take you through my entire career uh, and more to focus on one specific project that I've been working on. This is, it's not out yet. This is something that I wouldn't typically share something that hasn't already been released. But this is so well documented in history that I don't like feel badly about sharing it right now. So I've been working for the last uh, year now because of the the break in production on um, this show called Halston. It's a mini series. It's five parts. Um, and the office that Halston is a fashion designer in the 1970s, um, very well known, incredibly prolific. Um, had some of like the largest contracts that had ever been given to fashion designers at the time. He predates Calvin Klein. He predates all these other sportswear designers. Um, and so his office is very well known. Um, so once we sort of settled on certain things like the floor plan and like literally making it fit into the studio, which like, if you look at this plan, it, it like kind of doesn't fit. <laughs> we like really went back and forth a lot to like just get it to fit in the physical space. Um, one of the things we talked about really early on was like the most iconic part of his studio is it's right across the street from St. Patrick's Cathedral. And if you look at all these different images, you see St. Patrick's and you see that it's depending on where the camera is, it's always a little bit different. And so we realized really early on that like to truly sell that we were in a real space we would need to build these spires and have them like physically scaled properly within our set. Um, and you know, this is the kind of situation where, you know, designers give you input, but like they can't tell you what scale to do it in. That's all on you as a set designer to figure out. So what we did is um, we, I built this model in SketchUp. So here's my SketchUp model and we looked primarily at uh, this image here and then the image of him with Liza here as our touchstones to, um, to really ground us in what, what proportion those pieces needed to be. Um, so in addition to what proportion, you know, we built them in 3D, sort of figured out the proportions tried to match the image. In addition to that, you know, these have to be built by a shop somehow. And so I started doing uh, these different drawings. I, you know, essentially they're facets. So I laid them up flat and figured out what the, what the facets would look like if, you know, each one is a flat piece and then worked with our scenic department to figure out the depth to get the proportions right. The, the spires in reality are 330 feet from ground to top high and our grid is 27 feet. So this is just an epic back and forth between like reality of the real church and then the existence of like where we are. 
So we worked out in the model something that matched um, what it seemed like in the photographs. And then I ended up doing a fully like three dimensional uh, model where I like made all the coves, made all the curves, um, but split it so it could be like one triangle at a time. We ended up doing half of it. So we did four triangles, each with this elaborate routing. And we were able to send it to a CNC shop, a 3D routing shop that does 3D routing in foam. And because they were able to do it not as layers, but as like a full three-dimensional routing, I was able to draw it once and then scale it up for the second one because the two are obviously in two completely different scales. So to look at some images, um, sorry. Sorry, I've lost my images of where they are. It's the trouble of trying to run your own presentation. Okay, so we had the entire thing uh, routed out of blue insulation foam, which is like a pretty standard building material. Um, so it was like 3D CNC routed, it came to us like this. They ended up actually constructing it for us so that we didn't have to figure out the angles. Um, then from there, our scenic artists started carving in the grid lines to make it look like it was actually built out of stone. This is how it came in all wrapped up. Um, then they started coating it with uh, like a substance to make it look like concrete or like stone, uh, like a textured substance. So this is like ongoing, ongoing pictures. Once they finally got stood up, it was sort of the moment of truth to see whether we'd actually gotten our proportions correct. Um, So, and then when we got our drop in, that was really the moment of truth. So let me see if I have the photo to compare it side by side. So this is one of the ones we were always working off of in addition to
in addition to this one. So it was a, it was a pretty nerve wracking process because all you can do is try to see, see it in the space. You know, we ended up printing a flat version of each one before we built them and like lining it up to see if we've gotten the proportions correct. And, uh, you know, everyone signed off on that, but it's a very expensive endeavor to do something like this. And it's very nerve wracking to sort of have it all on your shoulders to, to make it all work. Um, and sometimes set designing is very creative in terms of working back and forth with the designer and coming up with like understanding their vision. And sometimes it's like really nuts and bolts, like we need to copy this thing exactly. And this is an example of copying something exactly and uh, it being all on your shoulders. So. Well, thanks. I'm glad, I'm glad you finally got it figured out to show us the, the build process because that's fascinating. They were massive. Um, thanks very much, Marie. And last but not least, we have Jane Shaw, who is here with us. Uh, I have to get remove spotlight. And um, there you are, Jane. And I will spotlight you. And uh, welcome, Jane. And uh, take it away. Hey, great. Uh, thanks so much. And do you see my screen that says something about sound design? Yes. I Did I successfully do that? OK, great. Uh, so this, I mean, someone said in the chat how interesting this has been so far, seeing all these different facets of the production process. And it is really amazing and so cool to end that last one where we come down to the details and specificity of one piece. So that's, uh, it's been a terrific uh, journey so far. And I'm going to talk about something totally different uh, using a different sense uh, that we all have, uh, uh, the sonic sense. Um, so. I had no idea that sound design was a job, uh, uh, much less that it paid, uh, even after having done a couple uh, in college. In fact, the, uh, the sound designer that I followed around at uh, American Repertory Theater uh, also handled the pyro at that time. So the first sound designer that I met blew things up. And so I thought, well, the sound seems really cool, but I'm never gonna blow things up. So I guess I can't be a sound designer, but I'm here to tell you if anybody has questions, to be a sound designer, you do not also need to do the pyro in the theater. It's okay. Um, we can all be sound designers. Okay. Uh, and I also, I came from, uh, like Lacey was saying, where uh, they came from in terms of undergrad. Yeah, I was a biochemistry major. I, you know, this was a total left turn uh, to go into sound. Um, but uh, I'm so glad I did. So let me see if I can get my little working. Okay. So I got a little nervous when I thought about how to define sound design because it's so different on every show and I think there's so many different possibilities. But here's a little bit of an outline of what I think sound design is. Now I will say I work uh, in theater and dance. Uh, you've heard a lot of people who are working in film and, ha and as well as theater today. Uh, there is obviously sound design in film. It's, it's handled by a larger department and has actually a more specific definition than in theater. Uh, so I, but so I'm sort of going to speak from a theatrical uh, point of view, but I don't want to ignore that. Of, of course, there's a lot of sound design in film. So for me, what's sound design? Okay, so it starts with this building music and sound layers. Just to read my screen that says that lift and deepen the emotions, suspense, fulfillment, and joy of a piece. And it can include compositions. Some sound designers are, are composers, but it's about designing this experience in support of what the director and choreographer are doing. Uh, it can it can show us context. This can be as simple as time of day with the lighting designer. This can be helping us with period. This can be all those things that we can't see in front of us visually. So if we're looking at us lo looking into a shop, do we know that it's a busy street outside or a not busy street outside? You know, developing the rest of the world, breathing into the space, is the joy of being a sound designer. Uh, along with the lighting and projection designers. Uh, we deal with a lot of the tempo of a particular show. So in time, 
So this is how fast we go from scene to scene, but also what might underscore some some uh, a scene. This and the underscore could be crickets and how angry those crickets are, or how lovely and romantic those crickets are. I'm, I'm I have a huge uh, affinity for crickets, but there's a lot more, obviously, right? You know, tone, uh, tempo, etc. It's the joy of being a sound designer. Uh, creating uh, amplification systems to support musicians and actors and in a manner to, appropriate to our production. So this is part of sound design is not just saying, okay, that, my, that actor, especially in musicals of today where we have amplified instruments, we need to put a mic on that, on that singer to be heard over those, uh, over those, uh, those yeah, instruments. But which mic and where is the mic going and how is the instrument uh, uh, mic'd or amplified? And do they come out of the system in the same way? Does the, does the singer come out of the center and the instruments come out of the side? The sound design for something like Kinky Boots that Greg worked on or Aladdin is very different than the sound design of something like South Pacific, which is more orchestral. You know, so all those choices are design choices. Uh, and then the last thing that I have on this list, there's so many other things, but uh, is, the, is the speaker system, which I thought, boy, it looks sort of boring at the bottom of my list, this delivery of sound through a speaker. But actually, I find this a really fun part of doing the sound design, because you get to look at, first, you look at what your visual designers have given you as a world. Like, where does sound come from in this space that they've created? Like, what are they hinting at outside those windows? Um, and then also like if you if if what is the play need from that space okay this the room looks like a very normal room but we're going to have a ghost enter how can that ghost be supported by sound should that sound come from the stage should it come from the side should it scare us from the back of the auditorium what space are we in what's this auditorium or this theater that or outside venue that we're in where can sound come from in that place so actually although it looks kind of boring but down there at the bottom of my list delivery of sound it's actually like one of a, a, fun, a really fun part of the job is figuring out what your sound system is going to be. Uh, I, at first, I was like, "Oh, it didn't." I didn't say that I was a sound designer composer. Oh, I should have asked De Deborah to say to include composition in the list because I do do composition. But I am essentially a sound designer. I want to support the story that I am working on. I'm not a lonely artist sitting, or I don't want to be. There's a lot of lonely artist stuff that happens with all of us. I think a lot of us spend a lot of time alone in our rooms. But I, the re, one of the reasons that I love being a sound designer and I love working in theater and dance is that I'm in the room with all these other artists. The, that collaboration is essential to just making me human, to making me a better artist, uh, and it is part of being a being a sound designer. So from the lead, from the somewhat hierarchical point of view. You are supporting the vision of, and I should I left out an important person off this first list, which is the first thing, which is the playwright. So the you're supporting the ideas of the playwright, the director, the choreographer, your producers. You are absolutely in this wonderful team of designers, and I can't tell you how much it's meant to um, hear everybody talk today and uh, make me a little weepy here because uh, I miss. Even though we all weren't working on a show, I miss all of you. I miss I miss us working together and being in meetings, um, and and arguing about whether I can have that sub under that platform. You know, I mean, I just I miss all of it. So, uh, but working with our, our our fellow designers is definitely part of it. There's also a lot of other creative people in the room. Fight directors. I spent a lot of time thinking about where if I'm going to amplify that punch sound, or if there's a whoosh that happens with the sword, or you know that kind of stuff. Vocal coaches how all of us figuring out how to lift that voice of the actor and get it to the last row in the house. Uh, music directors absolutely have an a, eye into what the, how that music should sound and how we can work together to make, uh, make it the best possible. And Greg touched on this a little bit in terms of like the artisans that we work with um, that you don't necessarily see in the theater. And these are the people that uh, we work with backstage or in rental houses, putting our stuff together or developing new software or working on new speakers. All of this is part of this family that you're working with. Uh, and so in some ways, I would just say, like, if you're interested in, if so far you've been interested in, in, in sound, um, think about if you like being that guy, you know, the guy in the, in the attic with his guitar by himself making his song. Or if you enjoy like being part of a being part of a group and making something else, they're both completely viable. 
but the but this what what I think especially when you add that design part to it, this is about a being being a collaborator. Uh, I wanted to think about or just show all of you guys what our offices look like as sound designers. And this is um, from a group of, uh, I have a, a group that I work with called um, TSCCA, which is Theatrical Sound Designers and Composers Association. And we did what we called a um, tech table still life contest. And these are some of my friends and their pictures of where they worked. Uh, and so, and I thought I'd, uh, they said I could share them, share them with all of you guys. And so you have a huge range of, of places that sound designers find themselves working. On the bottom left, you have uh, a, show, a Broadway show. Those, they're sitting on yellow balls for some reason. They must be very, uh, their abs must be very good after tech. But anyway, so that's the, that's the Broadway show. Uh, then you go up above that and you have a regional theater show. That's a show at the McCarter. That is the most organized sound designer desk I've ever seen in my entire life. That's Nick Cortita's desk. Um, and then in the middle is uh, Kansas City Rep. That's Cricket Myers, who's a West Coast designer working in Kansas City. I put those there, but just because traveling and doing regional shows are how I make a living. That's how I support uh, uh, doing more passion projects downtown that maybe don't pay as much. Um, but what's also great is that I, you know, we all get to go and and see different little microcosms across the country, see how different theater is made at Berkeley Rap, at, at Aslo in Florida, uh, Kansas City with Cricket, McCarter Princeton, that's where um, uh, Nick is in that photo. Uh, then in the bottom, in the middle on the bottom, that is a little Foley setup from Avenue Q. So sometimes your desk looks a little different. Sometimes your desk does not involve a computer uh, although I will say mostly my desk involves a computer. But in this case, the sound designer is a performer in the production. And in this case, this is Jeremy Bloom's picture. Um, he, you know, those, those shoes, he is making the footsteps. I guess somebody gets beheaded. That's why there's a cabbage. I'm not quite sure. I should have asked him. Um, but sometimes you're, you're working, you know, you, it looks a little different and you are part of on stage. This is I, I, I was going to say it's become a little more common. It's always been there. There's always there's always been some shows that have uh, sound designers more or foley artists uh, perform become performers on stage or just off stage. Uh, then the two on the right are two different sides. So we have in the middle there on the right are the uh, South Korean Olympics, uh, which uh, a sound designer was on a team for um, that I'll speak about in a second. She's uh, I've got another slide of picture of hers. And then I really want to celebrate the one that's on the upper right, which is, uh, this is a year after this particular sound designer won a Tony. And there he is doing a show in somebody's backyard and he's mocked up some kind of chair he can sit on and somehow run power, I hope, to his computer and he set up his thing on trestles. And that's just that I also love that this, this job takes us in all those different places and you have to be, I think, game to do it, you know, um, be okay that he went from, you know, fancy Broadway show to show in the backyard and he really loved that backyard show. So, uh, you know, it, the, the jobs are everywhere. And, and I do feel, I remember somebody said to me when I first got to New York and I was worried about getting work, they said, if you wanna work, it's there. If you're open to like, if you don't, you know, if you, if you just jump in with both feet um, and you're someone that people wanna work with, you know, and sometimes that's about talent, but sometimes that's about being good and fun in the room and being a collaborator. And so, yeah, it's fun. Uh, these are just a couple, this in terms of my journey, the way that I got here, just a couple of shots that were, I just wanted to share just because I found inspiration in many of them. So I started more in the dance world. Um, that's a, a piece called Innerscape on the top right. And then the music director at the time was a man named Taki Sukasugi. He's on the bottom left. Uh, I'd gone to grad school, I went to Yale, and there's a lot of talk in Yale about collaboration and meetings, lots of meetings, lots about thinking about being on the same page and working towards a common goal. Then I go, work to, go to work for Morris Cunningham and they're like, yeah, uh, we never rehearse together. We never hear the music until the show opens. And, uh, when I even tried to play some of the music for a piece in the dress rehearsal, I was I was totally shut down. Um, but but what that process brought me was like a just a different an understanding that everybody gets there in a different way. 
Um, this is a leading uh, modern dance choreographer who's had an enormous impact. He doesn't happen to do it the way you're taught in grad school. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> so we all make we're art in different ways. Um, and and I, I just say a couple of reasons I put some of the other pictures up are just uh, collaborations uh, that I've enjoyed. I've worked a couple of times with Darko Tresnak, um, who's been uh, instrumental in how I sort of think about uh, plays in in particular. Um, that's Tina Banco up on the left um, doing a, a solo show. She was beautiful in a very tiny theater in New York, uh, Studio Two underneath City Center. So, you I and I never, when I got into this, never would have dreamed of these shows, never would have thought this is where I was going. Um, it's, it's all been a surprise, but it's been fun. Um, how do you, like what, a couple ways to like get in, like how, I know it's hard to like figure out how, like how do you step in, how do you get that first job? And um, I, uh, I was lucky when I first got to the city, I spent a couple of years at, at NYU. Uh, uh, teaching sort of the freshman uh, basic lighting and sound classes. But there are a variety of ways to get your foot in the, in the door uh, that I think are really great stepping stones and let you learn about the industry. Uh, on the bottom right is a, a big picture of the mask sound, sound floor, like how you build shows. This is a great place to work. It's hard, it's dirty, you gotta wear steel toed shoes, blah, blah, blah. But you're learning how people are building shows. You're meeting the people that are building shows. You're impressing upon them that you are reliable. You're like, Greg had the story about burning the things out of the ro the wheels of the mannequin. This is the sound equivalent, is pushing around those, those heavy boxes. Uh, be a, go work on somebody's band, like those bottom, right, bottom left guys. Again, it's like simple sound, but you learn it and you learn how to sort of, that it becomes uh, second nature. The picture for them top right, Okay, Lacey, it's actually lighting, but it's the it's from the roundabout work um, program that they have uh, for young folks, and they didn't have a picture of them doing sound, but I know that they also support sound folks. Um, but there are internship and work, and those are they they put people into theater doing um, working on crews. That's a great uh, uh, advantage of living in New York. We have access to that. Uh, sound studios are great, and the reason I put the top left lady in is uh, she's Susan Rogers who was working on the floor of a shop and someone gave a call and said, can you come out and do record, be a recording engineer? And she was Prince's recording engineer for Purple Rain and for the next four years. So you never know who's gonna answer the phone, take you up on that job. And I know we're running out of time, so I'll just do a couple of pictures here of just the people, the wonderful people that are in sound and uh, that you can join. Um, uh, if you wanna choose to make this. Now, Aura Daigle over on the bottom right is no longer with us, I will admit. So she is not someone you could work with today. I just wanted to put her in just because she was um, the lead, she brought sound effects to radio. And uh, she was the sort of leading lady of, of uh, in sound design back, back when. Um, so she's a, one of our ancestors, our sound ancestors. Uh, this is Sunny Kill, who was the sound designer up there in South, in South Korea. And I just put a couple pictures of just like, it's so important, these relations. This is uh, the group of sound designers that did the park, uh, the Othello. Um, so we've got a set designer, Rachel Hauk, sound designer, um, and Tony Winter, Jess Paz, Tony Leslie James, who I'm sure the costume designers here know, uh, and Jane Cox, Jane Cox, a beautiful lighting designer. You know, these relationships are, are, are super important and last um, over years. Um, so just briefly in terms of people looking for jobs, there's so many different places that sound shows, that sound shows up and in all different sizes of venues. And I think there are people who have careers in one, in one strata of that you know, are, are mostly, but even, I have to say, even when I think specifically about some of the Broadway sound designers that I know, they've got a little downtown dance project that they really, that really inspires them and gets them excited. They've got the, um, you know, well, they're, everybody's doing radio now. Okay, so, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, there's work, there's work in all these different fields. And then when you bring them, when you move between them, you learn things, um, which I thought, which I think is great. Uh, and then we haven't, I think uh, we had talked just briefly in our little pre-meeting about uh, sort of the nuts and bolts of pay and people getting, um, uh, and I just 
just sort of in passing, I, I, I want to say that it's important that as you go into the workforce, you understand what you need. Like you understand what your actual bills are and how you can make it in the next work, the next week. And I definitely did that when I got to the city, they said, oh, I want you to be fee-based. And I remember being like, I just don't understand how to make this work. Can we put me on a weekly? I will show up and work on the sound for the week. I, I just, that's what I need to make it work. And they worked with me and they, and that's what we did. Um, typically, typically in theater, it's a design, it's a fee-based situation. So you're getting, you know, for whatever, however much time you spend working on that design, it's a, it's a number. There's a, some identity of like what the weeks are, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but a lot of these other jobs that I've talked about in terms of working on shop floors and recording studios, all the radio work, um, these in theater are uh, weeklies or hourlies. Um, and so, you know, you'll, you'll find you, you sort of have to be your own, um, you have to make your own budget and understand kind of what you need to do to, to put food on the table uh, and what, how you can make it work. Uh, but good luck to you all. And I know we've heard some amazing visual designers, but you could also be a sound designer. Okay, thank you. Wow, thank you. Um, such amazing presentations. I, yeah, lucky, lucky. Um, thank you each for your, your time with us. I'm gonna turn this over to Elizabeth Pompeo. Um, po Popeo. 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 Um, and it's okay, the only ones cringing are my students. They're laughing and it's good. Uh, well, good. Um, <laughs> and uh, she's going, to, she has uh, collected the questions from the chat and uh, we'll go till about 6.30. Um, and then I'll give a five minute warning and we'll do another five for those who can stay on. Great, there's a lot of really good questions here, folks. So well, let's try to get through them as quickly as possible. I'm gonna kind of start up at the beginning. Um, uh, there was questions for everybody, but um, Ted, could you very briefly describe what you said about PAs in the chat? Cause that will not be on our recording and we want it on our recording. There was a question, who, how do we use PAs or production assistants? So it'd be great if Ted can tell us out loud. Yeah, thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to really sing the praises of the production assistants because they are truly the glue that hold the art department uh, together. You know, if there's ever an emergency on set, they're the ones that run to help out. Um, it's an entry level position. Uh, you get paid for working 10 to 12 hours a day to watch and learn how a department runs and the scheduling and the deadlines the workflow and uh, learning how to anticipate the needs of the production designer and the art director and the other assistant art directors. And uh, also you get free lunch, uh, which often you will have to order and go pick up for the department. So it helps to be able to uh, you know, drive, but um, you're usually hired by the art department coordinator uh, with input from the art director and production designer. And uh, I think by handling all the materials that go into uh, making the show and, uh, you know, building the sets and choosing the locations, which you'll often have a chance to visit for surveying and other uh, reasons. You know, you can find out where God is in the details, basically, for, you know, choosing a molding for a door or hardware for a window. And uh, it, I think it gives you a chance to sort of learn where you want to fit into that um, arena. And once it's time for you to, you know, leave the nest, the people that you've worked with are there to nurture and guide you along the way when it's time to go and take that next step. So uh, I think it's a, a worthwhile thing to commit to for a season of a show or, you know, however long uh, you want to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. And I just wanted to add to that. It's been fun for me when I see a PA and then see how they grow, they've grown five years from now or 10 years from now. It's really been exciting to see how they got their start. Um, each of the panelists be thinking about how you got your start because that question is gonna come up later for those that didn't already tell us. Uh, am I saying your name right, Nika, or is it Naka? Forgive me, the next question's for you, if you would it's unmute. Nika. Nika, thank you. Yes. I was so excited Nika. to hear you talk about RISD because that's my hometown. Um, Yahir is dying to know how did you make that sign? I think it was the one that was kind of organic looking, uh, the second to the last picture. And then another question, what was the film at the very end? 
Somebody wanted to know that also. The Sky film at the end was the half of it. Um, it's on Netflix. And the sign that I made was actually the wooden one, I guess. That's the one I'm assuming. Um, that was in that film. And oh. that I did all in Photoshop. Um, Photoshop and Illustrator. And then and using some textures from iStock, laying those in. Um, and then that was used as a guide for the construction and scenics. And how did the scenics build it? I think they also wanted to see the follow through, even though you didn't physically build it. Yeah, I had a, I had a photo of um, the wooden piece that they used. I would have to find it. I don't have it right no, now. But it's, but, it's um, really cool that it people can see the extension, how it started with you and then it moves on to somewhere else. So that's yeah, yeah, yeah. They, the construction guys built the actual frame out of wood. Um, and then we had other the pieces cut out of Sintra, which is like a plastic. And then the scenics would paint and create like the texture of the rust on the uh, on the plastic. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Neil, this question's for you. Uh, by the way, I want to work for you. I wrote that down. I just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, the question is from Isabel Rubio. Can you share what skill sets you need to develop in order to be a set designer? I think you address this mildly, but maybe you want to just, I think it must be a um, question that is coming up for her high school students that she mentors. So. Oh, sure. I mean, you know, I think I think there's two kind of ways to think about this. One is like at the professional level, like if you're going out tomorrow with your resume to get hired in an art department or design a set, you need to know how to draw. You need to, I think nowadays you must know how to draw in a digital platform, either CAD or Vectorworks. Although I recommend that you start to learn to draw by hand, you should sketch. Everyone should sketch who's a visual artist. Um, and um, so drawing, um, I, you know, I studied architecture, so I had, had a lot of that kind of drawing a graphic background as my, my training. You eventually need to learn that. And then the other, besides the kind of, you know, hands-on graphic skills you need, I think you need to just have a constant, um, um, kind of visual curiosity, like you should be looking at, you know, I think it's important not to just be focused on your own, you know, you, you learn to do great production design and sets, not by looking at other sets in production design, you get that information from architecture, from art, from novels, from, you know, you need to feed yourself with ideas and visions that come from all parts of the world. So it's, that's that's not necessarily a skill, but it's like essential, I think, and important. You need to create that habit in your life of, um, you know, going to galleries, going to see movies, you know, doing all those things. And then, and yeah, yeah, I mean, the most important thing, I mean, you know, and then very specifically, I mean, I think now in our, you, you really need to have a computer drafting skills and um, Photoshop, basic graphic skills, um, be able to put together presentations, be able to, I guess just um, communicate your ideas, whatever you need to do to communicate clearly to other people. It's the thing, you know, it's always in your head and how do you convincingly make that happen? If I can jump in for a second, just based on like language around like set designer, art director, production designer, I think, you know, those are like really technical things that like we in the industry sort of know what they mean, but obviously like young people don't necessarily know exactly what the boundaries are between those different things. Um, you know, as a set designer, it is very much important that you know how to draft either in Vectorworks or AutoCAD or like another commute, like computer drafting program. There are still some set designers that draft by hand, but they're pretty few and far between at this point. Um, so I don't know if the question was based on the job of set designer or or just the like oh like if you're a set designer for theater which is not really the same the same thing um i mean you can be an art director and not know how to draft you can be a production designer and not know how to draft so it's i don't know it's like a greater discussion as to like how how you do your job within the different mediums Thank you, Marie. Actually, I'm going to leave you up here to ask the next question, and then I'm going to you after, uh, 
then I'm going to Lacey right after that. But as long as I have you, uh, Maria, somebody, uh, Naomi asked, do you frequently do your drafting and models virtually or do you prefer hand drawing and building physical models? So I, I think you sort of started to address that in talking about computer technology, but. Yeah, I mean, I was very fortunate to learn computer drafting in college in my undergraduate program. And that is sort of what catapulted me into uh, television and film because I came up in a time in which not everyone knew how to draw on the computer and just having the basic knowledge, not, e not even being like vaguely proficient, but just like knowing how to open the program and draw some lines gave me a huge leg up. Um, I have never professionally drawn by hand, uh, like drafted by hand. I have almost never built models by hand. People still build models by hand. That's still a real thing. But um, like for me, if someone was to call me and say like, oh, we want you to, we need a hand model built for something. I'd be like, you need, you should hire someone else. Like, that's not my, that's not my thing. I will build you a SketchUp model. I will build you a CAD model. I will do like a 3D model in CAD. But um, yeah, like there are people that are so much better than me that do um, like physical models. Great, thank you. And Liz Popiel, that's me, had a question. Can you tell me how much that one piece cost? Because when I've been doing film, sometimes it's that one piece that you have to have that you'll spend a lot of money on that one uh, cathedral piece or the two of them together. Roughly. Oh yeah, each spire. Yeah, roughly. Uh, they were it looked expensive. Oh yeah, no, they were very expensive. They were, uh, each spire cost $21,000. Thank you. Enough said about that. <laughs> um, Lacey, uh, Naomi had a question and it's a really good one. Uh, is it difficult to keep up with technology because it's so constantly changing in your area? can be tricky um, and it's sometimes it's impossible to keep up with all of it uh, but a lot of a lot of it is really accessible I mean there's a lot of things that you can learn online and you can learn really quickly and most of the design communities that work within um, you know a lot of the programs I use are very open to sharing knowledge and being there to ask questions of and um that's actually a really lovely thing to be able to do that um and and it's also some of the fun is keeping up with with the different technology and seeing what new people are people are doing with different things um, so do you uh, this is a question from me yeah. um do you feel that the uh art drew drove you specifically or the technology the technology drove you or the art I know they're symbiotic and important to fit with each other, but what do you think drove you? Because you yeah. look to be a little of both. I think for me. me, it's it's been a little of both. I mean, I the, the the storytelling aspect had a big piece to do with why I went into theater versus graphic design. Um, you know, and that's not to say graphic design doesn't involve storytelling, as as we have seen today. But um, you know doing more print art or more studio art um, versus doing something that was on the stage and had a live component that people were in the same room breathing with um, was important to me. Um, and the technology is for me a lot of fun. So I enjoy both, both sides of it. Um, and I agree with Neil, it's really important to go out and ingest and look at art and look at different things and architecture. And that's, that's a big part of, of of doing this. Great, thank you. Um, this question is sort of going to be for everybody, but some of you will answer it very quickly because you already addressed it. It Lisa at Lisa asks about your early arts education. So, Greg, you kind of addressed it. Is there anything else you want to add about your early arts education? You said you weren't doing much of it at all, and you told us how you started and how that happened. Is there anything you want to add to that? You're on mute, sir. Take yourself off mute. Thank you. Uh, briefly, I mean, the one thing I did sort of learn, key into as I got along my way was that I had subconsciously been soaking up a lot of uh, 
a lot about the business of clothing and related related to storytelling. Um, I remember I went to see a production in a, a, a 3,000 seat outdoor theater, a production of My Fair Lady. And I was with a friend of mine and I, we were in the back row and I said, hey, she's wearing that skirt. You, you wore that skirt at Grossman College. And the, the woman that had worn the skirt was like, no, how, why would you remember that? That was five years ago. And I said, I don't know why. I just know that that is a familiar skirt. And sure enough, so I guess um, it was in me. I think that's why when I really focused on it, uh, it came, it was never a chore. I never felt like I, I'm not gonna be able to, to, to take this on and, and own it. Because I think as a kid, I had always been, you know, uh, open to it somehow. What advice would you give people trying to get started in your path? That's from Naomi. She had that question. And what one skill do you recommend to have a solid foundation looking back on where you are now? I forget who said this. Was it, I forget, was it Jane? People have to want to spend time with you. You know, you can be the most brilliant muse of fire. But if you can't, if you're out of town in the heat of the moment and you're sobbing under a makeup table, <laughs> they're not going to be interested in your dilemma. Um, so you have to be uh, be uh, sort of a fortress that's fun, if you will. And then the other thing I, I always used to tell my students is when I was teaching, I, I was just to say to them, you know, we, we uh, jobs are, there's a very small community of people that do this, but there are, there's a very small number of jobs in a way, uh, depending on what your sort of gift is or your focus is. And I was used to say to them, if you go in for an interview, you walk into that room as if you have the power. Don't ever go in not thinking that you're interviewing them. They need you or else they do it themselves. And if you, uh, I think it's very, especially for costume designers, it's funny, we're the sort of old dinosaur, old world craft. We, you know, we use technology, but we use it to laser cut things and 3D print things. But we, so much of it, it's still a fitting room with a sewing machine and a, and a human being that needs to understand what you're there, how you're helping them to go and stand on a stage and tell their story. So I, I feel like it's very important to, I don't know, hug yourself, pat yourself on the back, understand that you are not just there to, to, to uh, bring to the table what everybody else needs. Uh, it, it's a thing, I, I think it's mostly a costume designer thing, but, um, and one thing that's great, I have to say that maybe the, the best thing about working on Broadway is that most of the time you are treated as a, as a, it's understood that what you're bringing to the table will inform the history of this project until somebody is brave enough to come in and reinvent the visual of the project. But 90% of the people that do Kinky Boots are gonna look at what we did and they're going to, in their way, try to do the best version of that that they can. So you are, you're contributing something. Uh, it's you're not you're not the composer. You're not the writer. You're not the fill in the. You're not, but that your part of it is crucial to the legend of this of of a success. <laughs> in a way. So I, I always think it's important to kind of keep in mind your your power, but then be generous in the process and not be a jerk. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Greg. You might want to read the beautiful comments that people are putting in the chat to you. Uh, Nika, I have a similar question. You told us about your early stuff and uh, RISD and drawing and your high school mentor. But um, adding on to that, what was? did you have any arts education before that? And then could you also tell us what advice you would uh, give to somebody getting started in your career path? What foundation do you think they need? What one skill? I know that's a lot, but thank you. <laughs> um, I always loved to draw and my mother noticed that. And so I was in art classes on the weekend pretty often um, in middle school. And then she 
got one of her friends who's an artist to, you know, give me little lessons. Um, and that actually helped a lot. Uh, she was kind of a mentor. I would go to her house and hang out with her and she would show me things. Um, so that was uh, indispensable. And one thing I think that people need when getting started is an open mind. Um, knowing that all the projects that we work on are collaborative and there's no ownership of one person over the project. And so knowing that you bring your, your freshness and your ideas, even if, you know, especially when you're new, it's just still part of a collective and we're all here to learn from one another and build with one another. And, um, you know, we also own our mistakes too, but um, it's all, it's all like working together. Like what Jane was saying, like we, you know, you miss working with people. That's not, that's why we're not working alone. You know, we, I work alone in my house, but I still collaborate with everyone on the project. So I think that's really important. Thank you very much. Um, Neil, same thing basically. Is there anything you want to add about your early arts education? Lisa wanted to know that. And what advice would you give to people trying to get started? I think you addressed it, but what one skill should someone focus on to have a solid foundation in your field? Um, okay, so the first part was, uh, you know, early, uh, early, stuff, early yeah. very early, definitely. Um, I always like to draw and make things. Um, and my parents definitely indulged me with classes and things like kind of similar to what Neko was saying. I was always taking a drawing class or a craft class and making things. And um, I think the thing that inspired me really like was not, um, I, I grew up in Southeastern Wisconsin and we went to, um, you know, there's, the school I went to was designed by, um, Talias and Associates, but Frank Lloyd Wright's company. I mean, of course, he was long gone <laughs> when, when I was there. But um, but I the I remember going to see Wingspread, the you know, and Racine, the Johnson White was built for um, Herbert Johnson. You know, walking. I think everybody has that creative or experience walking into something that you never imagined. You know, when I was whatever I was, 11, 12 years old that you never imagine, you know, this doesn't look like a house. This is some kind of fantastical, amazing creation. And um, and it really opens up your world. It just changes you and um, makes you want to make things and make things that people haven't seen before or um, experienced before. Or I don't know, whatever whatever art does to you. And, and I think it can be, um, you know, a space, it can be an album. It can be like, it doesn't have to be a you know, in a museum, it can just be something. It's it's important to open. I guess it, like the the what Nick is saying, open mind, being open to things, to experiences, to change. Um, and then skill, skill. I don't know. I I I I th I, 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 I think drawing. Like if you can draw quickly, what you're thinking. I mean, you have a lot of power in a room. You know, when you're in a meeting, um, and you can quickly sketch out what what's in your head. That's that's superpower. I think learn how to draw. You mean like this? Right? <laughs> you know, and you yeah. show it to him. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, Marie, uh, I don't know if you exactly, already spoke exactly. of those exact things, um, but we're looking uh, for your early arts education. Lisa wanted to know from everybody. And also what advice, I think you gave lots of advice, and what single skill do you think someone would focus on in your field for a foundation? Sure, I mean, um... My early arts education, um, I didn't really know much about theater growing up, but I, my grandmother was a unsuccessful dancer. Um, so we went to the ballet a lot. Um, so that was like my exposure to sort of like large scale productions. Um, and, I, and I went to college like knowing nothing about musicals, knowing very little about plays. But I, as I said, I went to, um, a very affluent public high school that had a huge theater program. Um, so I had this, I had a huge foundation that a lot of people don't have access to. Um, and then when I went to undergrad, um, you know, I was able to, to work within that and then come out of school with that foundation. Um, 
And then what was the second half of the question? Uh, what advice and what one skill would you give to someone focusing on doing, trying to do what you're doing? I mean, certainly I got my first jobs because I had some level of proficiency within AutoCAD. I would say at this moment, um, SketchUp is free. Anyone can download SketchUp. There is like a $500 a year version that is better. But if you are interested in being a set designer, or if you're interested in like previs, like something like that, you should just download the free version of SketchUp and start messing around with it. Draw your apartment, draw your house, draw your friend's house, just start playing with it because these are the tools that are like being used professionally and um, you, can, you can hone them pretty quickly. Awesome. I do that in my class to get them get their juices going. So I'm glad to hear you say it. Um, and we have two more people to ask that to. Lacey, could you tell us real quick, please? Uh, we only have a few more minutes, but uh, can you tell us your advice to give people trying to get started? And if that includes early education, great. And what yeah, one skill? Um, I know it's know, three things. I, I'm kind of from, from the different side. I actually don't have a whole lot of early arts education. Um, I remember studying it in elementary and junior high, but I took one art class in junior high and in high school, you know, the only art stuff I did was, was painting sets in, in, you know, the theater club. Um, so most of my skills I learned after I, after I graduated college, even as far as, you know, some of my digital art skills and, and the sketching and drawing. Um, so it, it's possible to pick up things wherever you are. You don't have to have that early early education necessarily. Um, and as far as, as skills go, um, I think the most important thing, and, and Neil kind of alluded to this, is just having the ability to communicate your ideas. And if that's being able to sketch well or, or quickly, um, but figuring out a way that you can show your ideas and share your ideas and talk about them is, is really important as far as being a collaborator. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And our last panelist to answer that question, and that's our last question for now. Uh, Jane, would you tell us a little about your early arts education, if you had any, and then um, a little bit about what advice you'd give people to try? But I think you addressed that and the one skill someone should have, you think, to do what you do. Uh, I'm always so horrified when people talk about cutting music programs in early education. And I just feel like I, the, my, it's just so terrifying to me because even though I'm not a performer, you know, it's not, but that those early programs where I tried out different instruments and I was a mediocre viola player for years and bad piano player and all that, like there have been studies. It makes us more collaborative. It makes us happier people, anybody. So uh, I just find that so important. So if it's, and so if it's not available to people, go out and try and, and make it happen for yourself in terms of like, you know, playing in a band or, 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 or trying to convince the school districts that it's necessary. So I just feel like that's so important to early education um, for everybody, whether they're gonna be a sound designer or not. Uh, all the things that have been said actually do, I think somewhat are, um, apply to, to sound. Uh, it's a time-based medium. Being able to sit and listen and think about it is important to have that focus and to be able to take that time. National version that is um, $500 a year, that does more. What's, what's amazing, and I think Lacey touched on it in terms of like how much help there is online for all these programs, especially right now, there are a lot of things that you can get for free or you can watch YouTube in, in, instructionals on. Um, I just encourage people to figure out something where they can make something. You know, if it's GarageBand or if it's right, doing it right in QLab, you can get a free two-channel uh, two version of that. Um, Ableton, uh, there's some free versions of that out there. Um, it doesn't matter, but if you can just start to like figure out how you can make something or play an instrument and or, uh, I think that's really great. Not every sound designer plays an instrument um, and not every sound, so it's, it's different for different people. Um, but I find the, those skills really invaluable. Thank you, Jane. Um, I just uh, thank you, everybody. I'm going to send it to Deborah in just one second. But I wanted to tell you guys that up at the top of the chat, if you scroll up in our last few minutes, is our website and our 
uh, ETDM YouTube page where you'll be able to find this in its entirety if you want to see any of it again. So um, I thank you. And now back to Deborah and Jane. Hi, everybody, and uh, thank you for attending. Um, Jane, do you have a few words to say? Jane Muskie? Oh, can everyone see me yet? Yeah. Okay. Hey, everyone. What a great panel, and thank you to our guests. And, you know, it's so funny when, I, when I'm when i hearing everyone talking, I'm thinking, we need, like, subsets of these workshops, like, workshop groups that come together because so many good things are thrown around. So I thank everyone and maybe we'll figure out a way to do that, like have the graphics workshop, the design, you know, that kind of thing. So thank you everyone. It, it really was a great night. Would everyone for our last shot be able to turn on your screen so we can have a screenshot of everyone who's here? Hey. Popping up. Hi. Fantastic. There'll be more than one page, Deborah. Do you want me to get both pages? Um, I have, have two pages. You got it? <laughs> Who is I that? I have everyone on one page. That's hysterical. Look okay, I'm getting it. I'm getting it. I got it. Oh, there's Victoria. Victoria, I always hear your questions. <laughs> yeah, you guys had great questions. It's really fun to see your faces. Thank you all for coming. Uh, look for our next Equity Through Design Mentorship panel in January. What's uh, the date on that? Um, oh boy. <laughs> I want to say- It's the... coming up. I think it's the second Saturday this time in January. We'll we send out a note. We to do sort of second Saturdays late afternoon. Uh, but, but you'll get the email everybody. Yeah, it's always at 4.30 and it'll, I think this one is the second Saturday but we'll send you out a note. So thank you. Have a wonderful uh, holiday season. And yes, thank it's you the panel. second night of Hanukkah, so right? Much. Or third night. Third night third. of Hanukkah. Third, third night. night of Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah to everybody that celebrates. Bye, everyone. Bye. Merry Christmas. Bye. Bye. Happy holidays. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.